welcome to Chronic Spontaneous Urticaria, New Hope with Emerging Targeted Agents, presented by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine at Immunology Live. My name is Dr. Jason Lee, Head of Toronto Allergists at the Toronto Allergy and Asthma Clinic. Activities on Immunology Live are interactive, allowing us to take questions in real time throughout this presentation. We encourage you to enter questions at any time in the box below. I'd like to now introduce my co-presenters, Dr. David Lang, Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at the Cleveland Clinic, and Kenneth Mendes, President and CEO of Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. I am delighted to be here with these two distinguished individuals, and thank you, David and Kenneth, for joining me today. Let's get started. So, these are our disclosures. Okay, for myself, Dr. Lang, and Kenneth Mendes. Learning objectives. So, chronic urticaria has been a passion for many of us and everyone here today. It accounts for high disease burden, resulting in delays in diagnosis and multiple treatment failures experienced by many patients when making therapeutic decisions. We want to explain the limitations of current management of chronic spontaneous urticaria with second generation antihistamines and anti IgE agents. Even when used optimally and maximally, and uh, as per the guidelines of recommended doses for CSU, many patients remain uncontrolled. And this is what we wish to address. We want to describe how agents that block cytokine and interleukin signaling involved in the T2 inflammatory pathways may provide an alternative to omelizumab for patients who are symptomatic in spite or despite using H1 antihistamines who are naive or intolerant or incomplete responders to omelizumab. I want to summarize the anticipated place of emerging agents targeting T2 inflammation in the treatment of CSU. And really, you know, we want to be able to explain this in a way that may challenge some of the uh, thoughts and the dogma that's been in this space for some time. So chronic spontaneous urticaria disease burden, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, uh, Kenny Mendes. Right. Thank you, Jason. So Alpha participated in a three-month study back in 2017 of patients with CSU and physicians who see patients with CSU. So the two groups, as you see here on the slide, were adult patients uh, who were being treated by an allergist, dermatologist, or primary care provider. And then there were healthcare providers who were part of that study who were specialists in either um, allergy or dermatology. The patients were interviewed in depth by phone, and we also asked them to keep diaries. Uh, and then the clinicians were also interviewed by phone. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see here, uh, this graphic helps illustrate the patient journey based on the interviews and the patient diaries. So you'll see from left to right here, uh, we've mapped the patient journey from the onset of symptoms through diagnosis. Then up and down on the left-hand axis, you'll see um, the journey characterized into these buckets of emotional, experiential, and medical buckets. So that's on the vertical axis. And you'll see a range of emotions and challenges captured from patient diaries and interviews here. Uh, and we'll come back to this later on. Um, but what we hear from many patients is that that journey to diagnosis is often cyclical and includes a lot of confusion, searching for answers, and seeing multiple healthcare providers. Later in the presentation, we'll talk about the middle boxes under searching for answers, and then uh, the other boxes under the diagnosis area on the far right-hand side of the graphic here. So on to the next slide. Here are some direct quotes from patients from their, their diaries. Uh, you'll see the one on, on the uh, left in the bubble there. One expresses patient frustration. You'll see helplessness, uh, no one understands them. But then the other two are revealing in terms of their quotes, saying this just lack of awareness by primary care doctors, which I think is one of the reasons why we're here. So back to you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, and speaking with my colleagues uh, across the world, you know, the awareness um, part is something that is a challenge and remains a challenge 
uh, throughout the world. So this is a publication in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which every physician in Canada gets a physical copy of. Here in our report, you know, five things that every physician should know about chronic spontaneous urticaria. So, you know, the, recognizing the hive, and I liked including the pictures and the photos because it really, uh, you know, sometimes there's a bit of a delay in diagnosis by not recognizing the rash. So here's the typical rash. The duration of this rash is very transient. Uh, we're talking hours. Uh, and you know, no more than a day. We see the angioedema and the same patient here. Both lips uh, are involved in this case. Um, so we, you know, we felt that this would make an impact, but there does remain still challenges. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lang uh, pass the baton here. Thanks, Jason. Um, so amplifying on um, the information that. Kenny presented in terms of the patient's journey, as you can imagine, um, when we see patients with um, chronic urticaria, they've, they've taken a big hit in terms of their quality of life. And uh, this was described in um, two papers shown here that were authored by Dave Weldon, who's an allergy immunology physician in College Station, Texas. And uh, an underestimated a factor involved in the impairment in quality of life, as shown here, is um, sleep disturbance. Uh, patients with chronic urticaria frequently have intense pruritus that uh, disrupts their sleep, um, such that um, this interferes with their daily functioning based on uh, daytime drowsiness that they experience. So um, uh, since uh, seeing these recent papers, it's uh, routine when I um, evaluate patients with chronic urticaria that I make a point to specifically ask about their sleep quality. Um, this is a classic paper all uh, back in 1969 by Champion and colleagues uh, from the UK. Um, and in their series, 554 patients with chronic urticaria, you can see that the majority of patients had both urticaria that is hives and angioedema or swelling, uh, with the remaining third about equally divided into those who had either urticaria or angioedema alone. Um, but the reason I'm presenting uh, this pie figure is uh, from this paper back in 1969, is that the cause of chronic urticaria, which is a question that patients frequently come to us with, is what's causing this. Uh, the cause in this paper was identified in 79% of patients. And if you read um, book chapters, review articles about chronic urticaria, frequently you'll, you'll encounter the, the estimate of 80%. 80 percent of these cases are uh, idiopathic and a cause is not identified. But if you look at the um, uh, the details of the study, um, and you look at those 21%, I think this is the source literature for that estimate of 80% in whom there's an unknown etiology or the condition is idiopathic, as we say. Um, you can see that a lot of these um, patients who comprise this 21% had physical urticaria syndromes, which really isn't a, a cause per se, uh, while 3% of these patients as uh, shown in this table, had what they called allergic urticaria. So a number of these cases were attributed to allergy to foods. Uh, in several cases, uh, the urticaria was attributed to an allergy to penicillin, assuming that when, we cons that, that when those patients were consuming uh, food items like meats or dairy products, that there was a trace amount of penicillin that was present in those food items, uh, which uh, generally is not the case. But even if we assume that this is possible, um, that's still a an estimate of 3% um, moving forward. In other words, um, the overwhelming majority of patients with chronic urticaria, we do not identify cause. And management entails realistic expectations and regular use of medication in order to control the condition. And um, now we have a question for you. What steps do you take in diagnosing chronic spontaneous urticaria? Um, please reply. A, blood tests. B, allergy testing. C, patient history. D, physical exam. E, all of the above. 
or F, unsure. So how do we uh, actually, uh, I think um, this would actually be a pretty good time to uh, take a question. Jason, can you, uh, do you have a question for us that's been submitted yeah, so from an audience member? I'm looking at uh, some of the questions that have come in. Uh, the first question asks, how fast do you recommend escalating um, the antihistamine dose in patients? So I don't know if you wanna take a stab, Dr. Lang. Sure, uh, in, in um, evidence I'm gonna present um, in a, um, a crossover study, this was done weekly. And I think that's a, that's a pretty rapid pace. There are some patients in whom uh, the dose needs to be escalated more rapidly based on lack of control of chronic urticaria. And there are other times that we can let time play a role. And um, uh, hopefully over time as patients uh, dose escalate, uh, they'll achieve control. Uh, so I think you have to individualize it and also allow patients to participate in the medical decision-making process in terms of whether they believe they're ready for uh, an escalation in their dose. Jason, I'd welcome your thoughts. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a big fan of shared decision-making with patients. And, uh, you know, some patients, no one's their best self when they're sleep-deprived uh, and, you know, quality of life is really impacted. So, you know, uh, exactly as you said, you know, we have to individualize the approach. We have to involve shared decision making. Sometimes I will, you know, up escalate the dose uh, based on the history of how many, you know, pills or how, what dose have they tried before and try to you know, gain control. Um, and and I, may, I may escalate the dose uh, much more rapidly in some cases. Okay. Excellent. Well, um, the, um, the majority who uh, replied to this question um, selected response E, all the above. So let me elaborate further on this. Um, in terms of um, all that we can do in uh, initial diagnosis management of chronic urticaria, um, when uh, I tell our fellows um, with whom I work that um, if I had a dollar to spend on everything we could do, 90 cents would be in the history. Uh, history is, is paramount and the most important element of, of diagnosing chronic urticaria. Physical exam is clearly important, but um, not infrequently when patients come to see us, they don't have urticaria lesions uh, that we can see. Clearly we wanna do a complete physical to be certain that we're not missing an underlying condition. Um, so physical exam is clearly important. Uh, laboratory studies um, may also be important to rule out an underlying etiology, but as I mentioned previously, that's present in um, a small minority of patients and the overwhelming majority. We do not identify an underlying cause. And again, management entails realist expectations and regular use of uh, pharmacotherapeutic agents. Uh, in terms of allergy testing, um, it's, uh, it would be unusual for chronic urticaria, that is urticaria that spans six weeks or longer, to be related to an underlying allergy. Food allergy specifically is uh, commonly suspected, but rarely confirmed. I wanna also um, mention that um, uh, patients who, um, uh, that providers should be aware, providers who are um, um, Participating should be aware that urticaria lesions are raised in erythematous uh, lesions that frequently have a, an erythematous or reddish hue, and that these lesions may not be as readily apparent in uh, patients of color. So what is the impact of routine laboratory testing and chronic urticaria uh, management? Uh, we investigated this in a study carried out here at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a retrospective analysis of a random sample of adult patients with chronic urticaria over uh, a nine-year period from 2001 to 2009. We identified 365, excuse me, 356 cases that fulfilled these criteria. They were diagnosed with chronic urticaria according to uh, medical record uh, coding, and their laboratory studies were ordered here at the Cleveland Clinic. 1,872 laboratory tests were ordered for these 356 cases. Uh, 319 or 17% were abnormal, and 30 patients or 8.5% underwent additional testing. And uh, what we found, as shown here, was that uh, many of these tests were frequently abnormal. 
the normal uh, in the stack column, the normal uh, tests are shown in, in green. Um, about a third of CBCs were abnormal, about 10% of complete metabolic panels were abnormal. Um, about one in every six erythrocyte sedimentation rates was abnormal. In some cases, these uh, abnormal tests led to repeat tests. And uh, some of them, uh, sometimes in terms of liver enzymes or other tests that were abnormal, led to referrals with uh, other specialists. The question we asked was, um, in what proportion of cases did these abnormal laboratory tests lead to changes in management that resulted in an improved outcome of care? And the answer is one patient. Um, it was a patient of mine who uh, had a, a myocardial infarction, and for this reason, her dose of thyroid hormone supplement was lowered. And on laboratory testing, she had um, abnormal thyroid uh, tests, and um, we hiked her uh, thyroid hormone dose back um, to uh, pre-myocardial infarction levels and increased her antihistamines, and her, her chronic urticaria improved. So out of 356 cases, one test, one patient had an abnormal test that led to a change in management that resulted in improved outcomes. Uh, these are more recent studies um, indicating that routine laboratory screening in patients with chronic urticaria is not cost-effective and doesn't improve outcomes. The ICER here, which stands for incremental cost-effective ratio, when this is very high, as you see here in this slide, uh, this means it's not cost effective. And there's um, um, a more recent study also shown in this slide um, indicating that um, changes in management in uh, 725 patients with one or more tests performed and 75% uh, did not lead to improved outcomes and that this rarely uncovered uh, clinically significant findings. This being said, um, we will perform a uh, laboratory testing, um, but recommendations from the um, an urticaria practice parameter or guideline from 2014 from the American Academy of Allergy Asthmatology, American College of Allergy Asthmatology uh, recommends this, tending, this testing should be selective. There's an honest difference of opinion, including how many tests or what the appropriate tests are, or whether to order tests in patients with chronic urticaria. Um, but the um, guidelines task force group recommended these tests shown in the lower panel of the slide, complete blood count with differential, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, liver enzymes, and thyroid stimulation hormone, but the utility of routinely performing these tests hasn't been established. This is the Choosing Wisely campaign from the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American Academy of Allergy Asmenology uh, participated in this, and basically the message to uh, physicians is uh, to not routinely do extensive diagnostic testing. That's the key, is there may be instances where diagnostic testing is warranted based on a, a finding that comes up in the history or on physical examination, uh, that's appropriate. But if uh, history is otherwise unremarkable, physical exam is otherwise unremarkable, extensive testing rarely leads to, to abnormal findings that then lead to a change in management that will improve outcomes. So uh, it's also important uh, that we screen for physical urticaria syndromes. And uh, this is important based on the avoidance measures that may be appropriate. For instance, uh, for someone who has um, dermatographia, which is the most common uh, physical urticaria syndrome that is observed. Uh, people are aware of this because when they scratch themselves, they get, they get red streaks. This is a property shared by about three to 5% of the general population. And uh, the people who have this need to wear uh, looser clo clothing and be mindful that they're going to have um, lesions that appear on their skin due to trauma or stroking. And so avoidance measures are directed based on uh, diagnosing a physical urticaria syndrome. And it's also a prognostic factor in that evidence indicates that if you have a physical urticaria syndrome as part of your chronic urticaria, um, that uh, it's probably, the chronic urticaria is probably going to have a longer duration before it resolves. Okay, so and what now, I gather... Uh, we're going to hear a patient's story. Yeah, so what I gather from uh, you, Dr. Lang, is 
really have to focus and ask the right questions and really speak to our patients because oftentimes they'll they'll tell you if you're listening. Um, so the patient story part, um, we're going to look at current approaches, sorry, patient story part, uh, and it may help guide us in terms of current approaches and limitations. So I was 16, about to turn 17. <laughs> so 25 years ago, way back in the day, um, and it came out of nowhere. It was one day, all of a sudden I had some kind of things. I'm pretty sure it started off just on my extremities, like my legs and my arms. And it was just a few. And I honestly, I was a teenager. I didn't even know what they were. I had never had hives before. Luckily, my uncle uh, was an internist at the time. He had his own family medical practice. So my mom instantly, you know, touched base with him. He's like, oh yeah, they're hives. She, you know, something she ate. Maybe it's the a laundry detergent. It's probably just something minor like that. Just kind of shrugged it off. Like, give it some time, you know, try to eliminate a few things. It'll be okay. Um, a week or two of that, with everything getting worse and not getting better, was the kind of, those last straw. So my mom did take me to a specialist. I did go to an allergist. Um, and of course, they do the allergy tests, the blood work. They do the elimination diet. We looked into detergents, perfumes, things like that. None of that was the issue. Um, so then it was, okay, we're going to throw her on H1 blockers and H2 blockers, and we'll see what happens. And it got so bad um, within just those few months. The angioedema got really bad. Um, so I had a lot of swelling, hands, feet, even like my lips, um, that's where he kind of started throwing up his hands and was like, let's put you on a corticosteroid. Um, and that was definitely the only thing that put a dent in it. That all started in 97 when I was 16, almost 17. It wasn't until 2002, 2003-ish that I was actually diagnosed with autoimmune chronic urticaria. I break out in hives all the time. And there's no rhyme or reason. Like I could be sitting on my couch watching a movie and all of a sudden start feeling like a little bit warm or itchy and look, and I've got hives on me. Um, same thing, uh, I could walk outside and it's you know super cold, but then I come back inside and it's warm in the house and I will just wash down in hives from head to toe. So he sent me to a dermatologist who was supposed to, supposed to be a specialist. Um, and I got there and sure enough, I was sitting in the doctor's office and he's talking to me and from here down, just washed completely over with these big, ugly red patches. I talked to um, this dermatologist and he basically goes, yeah. It's because you have autoimmune disorders and your body's like freaking out on you. Um, the best thing I can tell you to do is when it happens, take an antihistamine. And that was the extent of the treatment that I was offered. So okay. now we're going to move on to um, approaches to uh, management of chronic urticaria and um, limitations in the therapies that we currently have. There's a European and a World Allergy Organization guideline um, in, Strive in which uh, this question um, was posed, should treatment aim at complete symptom control in urticaria? And the response in this guideline was yes. I would say that um, uh, that clearly is, uh, um, being high free is clearly is a uh, uh, laudable goal, uh, but there are patients in whom uh, near complete uh, control would probably is, is sufficient. Uh, and again, this gets back to shared decision-making in terms of, of matching the treatment with the values and preferences of our patients. This is clipped from the, uh, from, uh, the same, uh, from a similar guideline where um, the first um, 
the European World Allergy Organization guidelines and the US guidelines to which I alluded to previously uh, agree that the first line treatment is a non-sedating or second generation antihistamine and that when uh, symptoms are not well controlled um, that we advance as um, uh, Dr. Lee and I discussed previously, we dose advance this to four times the FDA approved dose and this is supported by evidence that I'll review momentarily. And when patients don't achieve um, what they perceive to be adequate control of their chronic urticaria syndrome, then it's time to offer them um, another form of therapy, such as omelizumab, for the treatment of antihistamine-resistant chronic urticaria. So there is high quality evidence supporting uh, antihistamines, or as we call them, H1 antihistamines, as a preferred first line therapy from multiple randomized controlled trials that have been carried out for the last 70 years. Uh, second generation agents are preferred uh, because they're better tolerated, that is, they're non sedating. Uh, this is the, uh, this is now we're in Bulgaria where. Um, these investigators carried out a study in which they recruited 80 patients with uh, antihistamine resistant chronic urticaria and 72% had been treated had been treated previously with oral corticosteroid. Uh, these patients were randomized to one of two second generation antihistamines, either levocetirazine or adesloratadine, and then they came back every week. If they were controlled, they exited the study. Uh, if they were not controlled, they were dose advanced. Uh, to uh, two times and ultimately coming back every week, four times the FDA approved dose of uh, either of those two agents. And if they weren't well controlled at, at the uh, four time dose level, they were crossed over to the other antihistamine. So as you can see in the uh, right panel, uh, about 75% of patients were responders to higher than conventional doses. And among those who were switched over from desloratadine to um, levocetirazine, um, several of the, a number of those patients also improved. So this is high quality evidence, the methodologically sound study, supporting dose advancement in the management of patients who don't respond to FDA approved dosing of these um, medications, which is generally one tablet a day. So we go up to four tablets a day, and um, as shown here, again, um, this is from the uh, European or World Allergy Organization guidelines. When uh, patients graduate to four times the FDA approved dose and they don't achieve control, um, the uh, guidelines uh, stipulate that um, omelizumab uh, should be trialed for a minimum of six months. And if they don't achieve control on omelizumab, uh, then cyclosporin, uh, another so-called alternative agent can be administered. So there are uh, a number of what we call alternative agents that can be prescribed for patients with um, antihistamine resistant urticaria. A number of these are supported by um, literature that entails case series or case reports, but these are subject to bias, don't provide high quality evidence. Only five agents have been studied in randomized controlled trials. Um, the, most, uh, the agents studied most frequently being omelizumab. Cyclosporin, which I mentioned in the previous slide, has been uh, studied in three randomized control trials. Uh, this is a forest plot that combines data from two such trials. And um, in this study, um, more than three and a half, uh, excuse me, uh, among those randomized to cyclosporin compared with those randomized to placebo, those subjects randomized to cyclosporin are more than three and a half times more likely to experience benefit in symptom scores in terms of urticary activity and urticaria severity scores. This provides evidence supporting the therapeutic utility of cyclosporin. However, there are methodologic shortcomings that were recognized in these studies, such that it's unclear whether the potential for desirable effects significantly outweighs the risk for undesirable effects. And so, Administration of cyclosporin and a number of these other agents, including the, the agents I showed on the previous slide, uh, it, this, is, this would be associated with lower quality evidence and a weak recommendation based on current evidence to use these agents, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't prescribe them, but it, it, it is a signal that um, a navigational signal for healthcare providers that it's appropriate to discuss uh, the pros and cons of each of these medications with patients and allow them to participate in the medical decision-making process by expressing their values and preferences. 
Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial from 2013, New England Journal of Medicine. And this was one of the early reports that demonstrated the therapeutic utility of uh, omelizumab at doses of 150 milligrams or 300 milligrams um, every four weeks um, that led to FDA approval of omelizumab for the treatment of patients with antihistamine resistant chronic urticaria. Um, this is a study, um, a, sim a similar study in which uh, patients were randomized to omelizumab compared with placebo in a ratio of three to one. And um, what you see here is that in the blue line are those individuals who were randomized to omelizumab 300 milligrams every four weeks. And you see that promptly upon receiving omelizumab, the, um, the weekly itch severity score goes south. And uh, it also declines in those receiving placebo, but there is a substantial uh, clinically significant and statistically significant difference such that those who were randomized to omelizumab experience um, dramatic benefit that persists for the duration of the 24-week trial. But what you also see is when omelizumab is suspended at the 24-week point, um, that the benefit does not persist. And by week 40, uh, the subjects randomized to omelizumab are basically back to square one. So now um, it's uh, my pleasure to pass the baton back to Dr. Jason Lee, who's going to um, discuss um, managing chronic spontaneous urticaria and patients who are symptomatic despite uh, H1 antihistamine or those who are naive to intolerant who are incomplete responders to embolizumab. Jason, what's on the horizon? Yeah, so, you know, as you alluded to, you know, sometimes patients are still not controlled and um, you know, in spite of following the guidelines, a lot of patients don't want to do cyclosporine. So we really, you know, uh, need a deep dive into what is the etiology or the causes a lot of patients like to look at. And we've had significant advances in this particular area of medicine over the last 10 years. I'm going to take you through some of the data that's kind of changed the way we conceptualize and think about chronic urticaria. So... Uh, we, we knew for some time that there was probably an autoimmune uh, basis to a lot of patients' hives. And you know this is a publication for 2008, but serum, autologous serum testing came before this. So something in, in the blood, something within the patient, well, you know, may have been responsible. So we, you know, discovered that some patients actually form an antibody, an IgG antibody to their IgE, their allergy antibody. So, you know, a bit of a, a conceptual mouthful, but an antibody toward your own allergy antibodies, which activates the cell and crosslinks. Other people react to the GLU portion, the uh, high affinity IgE receptor called FC epsilon R1, and they have an IgG antibody toward this part. So it's not clear why some people develop this, but the end result is you get degranulation of the cell and hives as a result. So what we also know is that you know, there are more than just allergies that can trigger these mast cells. So this is something that I think there's a bit of an educational gap in medical school, because certainly I did not learn this in medical school. It's something I learned in fellowship and, uh, and gradu upon graduation. But these mast cells can be triggered uh, for the physical triggers, as uh, Dr. Lang uh, brought up before. But stress, tachykinin, so substance P, neurokinin A, can trigger this, these cells as well. There is a neurohormonal uh, you know, arc to this. Complements, which are sometimes active in autoimmune conditions, other in autoimmune conditions, but also in the setting of an infection can cause this. Everyone kind of, you know, was surprised that sometimes COVID can trigger this, but of course, with any infection, you've got disengaged. Toll-like receptors, again, activated and engaged in infections can trigger this. And a host of direct histamine releasing agents. So everything from alcohol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, narcotics, and uh, you know, uh, cannabis, uh, and seeing a lot more of that lately with the legalization. IgE uh, or anti-IgE and anti-FC epsilon R1 autoantibodies was the you know the first two discovered autoimmune mechanisms. We know a bit more about this, and we know that omelizumab you know largely works by binding to free IgE, which then prevents uh, you know the IgE from binding to the mast cells, which acts as a receptor. We get, over time, a decreased expression of the FC epsilon R1, so there's less receptors that can engage. 
and we get decreased mediator result because the cell is just not turning on as much. So, you know, we know that this is the likely and one of many mechanisms. There are a few other mechanisms at play here, but uh, for the purposes here, we're going to move on. And this is a data looking at what you can expect from using antihistamines. And again, I share this data typically in my shared decision making with patients because oftentimes patients are frustrated they're not getting better. And you, you find out they've only gone up to one or two times the uh, licensed uh, approved dose. So at a single dose, you're really looking at about a quarter of patients getting significantly improved or being symptom free. And you know, at double the dose, you get about 40 patients. Now I'm gonna fast track to the four times dose. Even at four times the dose, you're really looking at about a 60% of patients who respond who are significantly improved or symptom free. So that still leaves about 40% with only a slight or no improvement at all. So as such, we did the glacial uh, trial, we did the Asteria trial, looking at omalizumab as an option. Uh, when we look at these patients who've been these trials that um, not everyone gets an order carry activity score under six. Um, this is a scoring system that we use to track as objectively as possible the order carry activity. And we see that about a third to even sometimes half patients may not uh, improve significantly in their, or to a point where they no longer notice an effect on quality of life. So we look at these tri uh, trials in graphical form. I've laid out Asteria 1, 2, and Galatial here. Uh, there was a dose ranging study for Asteria 1 and 2, so you see the different colors there re representing the different doses that were tested. And the patients who achieve early carry activity score less than 6, meaning, you know, high free or very significantly improved, uh, you know, you see that we actually are not able to touch some patients in spite of, uh, you know, using a biologic omalizumab. So then we look at patients, uh, this is like... Um, so uh, this is data from the Optima trial, uh, which we were happy to partake in uh, in Canada. We look at you know the effect of a step up therapy going from a 150 dose to 300 dose, and in this data as well, you see that there are, remains many patients that are uh, continuing to experience early carry activity scores more than six, and uh, you know in fact quite a few patients who remain with uh, very severe uh, early carry in spite of you know, the omalizumab therapy. And when we look at Asteria 2 data, we look at the lowest rates of angioedema seen at edema component, which is not uh, optimally treated in all cases, even in spite of the 300 milligrams of omalizumab. So, you know, it does help, but not in all comers. I have another patient story to share. For about nine months, nine months, which is a long time. And they weren't like tiny dosages. Like I was on a good, enough to completely control the hives. Um, because without it, I was itching till I bled. I was head to toe. Um, so the corticosteroid put on at least, I'd say, 20 pounds of water weight pretty quick. And that was really tough. Um, but then it did get worse. Um, as we tapered off of it, um, I started to get daily migraines. And they were bad. And I was a kid. I'd never had, I mean, even a headache. I really didn't have headaches. Um, I had migraines every day. And it was bad. <laughs> um, I would go to sleep or try to, and I couldn't sleep. Once we got off the prednisone, we were still on all the other oral stuff, all the H1, H2 blockers and some random stuff, all oral medications. Um, and once it seemed like once I was off the prednisone, I wasn't breaking out, but everyone was afraid to take me off of the H1, H2 blockers. They're like, if we do this, then you're miserable again. It's gonna be like fighting all over to get it under control. So I stayed on a lot of those medicines and I pretty much believe that through most of college, I was still taking something just for the fear of what would happen if we totally stopped. So when he asked me about the experimental drug, about the immunosuppressant, um, he's like, you know, it's used for those who are getting, you know, um, kidney transplants and, you know, things of that nature. He's like, but we're going to try it for your hives and we're going to see what happens. I said, okay, I trust you. 
it's like, it almost instantly worked. So it was amazing. But there were also a lot of concerns that come with that too. Now you're more susceptible to get sick. All kinds of different things. Um, I did have a lot of side effects. I went a few more years to my next flare up. I believe it was around 2011. Um, that one hit real hard. We did all the same stuff and it got me through that hump. Um, so same side effects, same other oral medications, but it worked. That one lasted, I think the longest, that one I think was a good year and a half that it took for me to get through that one. Last year, our dog died. <laughs> and of course it's during COVID, it's August of 2020. And a week after the dog died, I could feel them coming. The angioedema started coming back. And that, I, I gotta say, that is even more painful than the itchiness. Itchiness is just maddening, but the pain, like it would always be in the palms of my hands and my feet to where that swelling, it almost feels like it's your skin's just gonna burst open. Um, that's what was tough. And when it got to that point, she's like, we have to put you on the corticosteroid. She's like, it's the only relief you're gonna get. We'll try short term, we'll see what kind of a low dosage we can do, but we've gotta do it. And we did, and it did help temporarily. <laughs> and that's where she said that over the nine years that I was extremely lucky and didn't have an outbreak, didn't have a flare up. She said a lot of research has been done. I got into her office and they said, well, first we do sample injections because we want to see if it's going to help you. So we did one and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. And I didn't get any relief. And because it wasn't doing anything, we had already tapered off the prednisone. So I was back to being miserable again. Wow. So that was the individual patient here. But again, uh, this is the second half of the graphic we showed earlier. This portion represents the patient journey after diagnosis through treatment. And as you heard, once patients are diagnosed, they continue the cycle of searching for answers and trying to find different approaches for management of the disease. And patients report seeing different physicians and feeling temporary relief when treatments are effective, but then anxiety and anger when breakouts occur, as you just heard. So patients commonly tell us that they're frustrated over the idiopathic or spontaneous nature of the disease. They always feel like the hives are caused by something specific, like an allergen or clothing. They also feel frustrated. They can't find a specific cause. If you look at the next slide here, just a couple of quick quotes here that you see, again, amplifying the, the frustration. And then finally, as the clinicians reported, you'll see here, equal frustration, concern over the best course of treatment, and then this nagging thing with cost insurance and implications of the treatment. So back to you, Jason. Okay, so we have a polling question here. How would you rate your experience level with treating people who are not responsive to antihistamine on a scale of one to five, where one is no experience at all, and five is very experienced? And while you're thinking about this, I'll take another question here from the uh, questions that are streamed in. Um, is there a way to identify those who will not respond to omalizumab? Uh, Dr. Lang, do you want to try to tackle this one here? Well, um, unfortunately, there's no established way to uh, screen patients to know whether they're going to have a, a favorable response to omalizumab. So we, we um, monitor them carefully. Uh, during the course of omalizumab. Uh, some patients have, uh, uh, like many drugs, in some patients, the response is dramatic. It's, it's a game changer. Uh, there's a second group in whom the response is more modest, but definite. Um, and a third group in whom um, you know, omalizumab doesn't help. And after a number of months, we suspend omalizumab and, and strive to treat them with other agents that can help. Yeah, so we don't really have a biomarker or you know, a prognosticating tool. Uh, I'm sure someone will work on some AI version at some point in the future. So Let's I'm go gonna, is that because we need it? Yeah. Um, okay, so we got the uh, split uh, results here showing up in the poll. 
you're going to move on. So, you know, like many allergists uh, in practice, we have many patients who really, you know, are not helped in spite of using everything. Um, and so there's a role to kind of relook at this and, you know, having a background in immunology prior to medical school kind of let me really dig down to some of the basic science. The conceptualization of urticaria has really been thought, and I've been taught in fellowship that it's, you know, nothing to do with type 2 inflammation, there's nothing to do with TH2. But, um, you know, the looking at some of the advances that have been made, I thought that it was worth a try and that there was a chance that we were wrong about how we were thinking about the, the condition. So this is a patient who had failed uh, all conventional treatments. Uh, she was really not willing to do cyclosporin. So, you know, she has some areas of atopic dermatitis. So I published in, in uh, Journal of Allergy Clinical Immunology and Practice, and she had a, you know, a very dramatic improvement with uh, dupilumab uh, after failing omalizumab for quite some time. So we, those are her pictures uh, before, obviously. And then we, you know, I formed these ideas because we thought that omalizumab works in patients with delayed uh, response, and we look at basophil activation test reported as BHRA here uh, in patients who have basophil uh, activation, which signifies that they have an autoimmune chronic urticaria. They do respond, but may take some longer. This is some of the clinical data. But, you know, we look at other epidemiologic data like this. This is a claims database of many, many patients. So, you know, tens of thousands, close to 100, looking at patients with eczema, atopic dermatitis, and seeing what the common comorbidities are. And we see that nasal polyps is common, but the number two most common that you see here is uh, urticaria. So there's clearly some kind of basis, at least we can see. Then you look at cells involved in type two inflammatory conditions. Uh, these are the cells that produce um, interleukin five, four, and 13. And we see that, again, we like to conceptualize and compartmentalize, but these all play a role in activating one another and maybe dysregulating one another in terms of prolonging or creating a, a conditions to propagate inflammation. We look at the multiple causes and pathways for chronic urticaria. We see a multitude or a plethora of ways that these cells can get activated. So I showed you the simplified cartoon, but here's a, a, a more comprehensive list uh, published by Church and World Ag Allergy Organization Journal. Then we look at responders to uh, omalizumab and what happens to the immunology of a patient receiving omalizumab. We see that in the responded population that those who successfully improve actually have a marked decline in things like interleukin-13 or uh, that cytokine. We also see that the population of different T cells, we see CD3 positive and the total and CD4 and CD8 positive, the changes occur preferentially in the cytokine profile of omalizumab responders with a marked decline in some key critical cytokines, which are intimately linked to type 2 inflammation. I'm going to be very quick here because this is eczema. This is not urticaria, but in eczema, you have a breach of the barrier. The immune cells see this. They go uh, have a dance at the lymph nodes and they start pulling out other effector cells out of the blood, bone marrow. These start and initiate an inflammatory cascade and create the conditions and chemical signals for more cells to stream in. This affects all sorts of things, but includes barrier disruption, decrease in antimicrobial peptides, the S100 there you see, you get the start of the itch scratch like canification schedule or uh, trap, I, I like to call it. So we see that there's a role for type two inflammation starting to itch. And itch is a very important part, uh, an integral part of chronic urticaria as well. So IL-4 and 13 is intimately involved here. This dysregulation continues and you get chronic things. This in atopic dermatitis involves different effector cells. So the way I thought I'd conceptualize this is by looking at it and is, are we just seeing a different manifestation of a similar dysregulated immune system? But I, you know, to further this idea, we look at the story of GATA3. This is a tra nuclear transcription activating factor. So when you're, for example, your interleukin-4 receptor sees uh, and gets phosphorylated, you get a downstream transcription of STAT6. STAT6 phosphorylates, 
goes in, activates GATA3, which complexes Vox B3, but this really largely regulates IL-4, 5, and 13. This process, we don't know how certain cytokines get preferentially activated over others, but I felt that the mast cell is responsible uh, and preferentially activated by certain chemokines in this transcriptional domain. And again, I glean on clinical evidence from other areas. So we look at the Pelimap suppressing total IgE results to get less class switching with IL-4. IL-13, which independently creates IgE, it, um, is again also blocked by Dupilumab. So I reason that given that some autoimmune order carriers from autologous IgE to things like thyroid peroxidase, if you decrease the total IgE, you decrease the potential signal. We see that in asthmatic patients who receive dupilumab, you can stratify and predict prognosticate response to the medication by how much um, baseline IgE that they have. The more baseline IgE you have, the better you tend to respond to dupilumab. We also see uh, that if I you know, use all this, we have more than enough, I guess you can call it circumferential evidence or circumstantial evidence to you know, reasonably try for the patients who failed omalizumab. And I did exactly this in my first six patient experience. Every single one of these patients had failed multiple uh, months of omalizumab uh, from anywhere from four up to 38 months. Um, and every single one of these patients had a marked reduction in their urticaria activity. So I sat in the room and uh, you know, thankfully Regeneron, and I'm very grateful to this, Regeneron and Sanofi listened and they accelerated the program for chronic urticaria. So we arrived at Cupid, uh, Liberty Cupid, which is the phase three trial of using dupilumab in urticaria. We've got two arms of this trial, but we looked at 138 patients with moderate to severe CSU over the age of six, uh, and including the age of six, who failed antihistamines and uh, the study A arm, they were in omalizumab or anti-IG treatment naive. The other arm included patients who had you know, previously not gotten the outcome that they wanted while being on omalizumab. So we look at comparing efficacy and safety of dupilumab as add-on treatment to the antihistamines, which is a treatment arm, to antihistamines alone, which is a placebo arm. We look at change in baseline and itch scores at 24 weeks, and then change from baseline and itch in hives at 24 weeks. So we look at uh, the results from this, 63% reduction in H severity with dupilumab versus 35 patients with a standard of care as measured by the 21 point uh, H severity scale. So this is a marked improvement and allows some of our patients to be at their best because they're not suffering from the itchiness and sleep, uh, ensuing sleep deprivation that uh, is associated. 65% reduction in urticaria activity, both itching and hives, severity with dupilumab versus 37% in standard of care. Again, this is measured on the 42-point uh, UAS score or urticaria activity score. We had a 20.53-point uh, reduction in dupilumab versus a 12-point reduction with standard of care with continuous improvement out to week 24. The safety, you know, dupilumab is a drug that we know and have a lot of experience now with atopic dermatitis, nasal polyps, and asthma. The safety uh, was consistent with the known safety profile of the already approved indications. I'll hand it over to Dr. Lang here for legalizumab. Thanks, Jason. So legalizumab is a next-generation high-affinity humanized monoclonal anti-IgE antibody, similar to omalizumab, which is an anti-IgE antibody as well. But legalizumab provides greater and longer suppression of skin tests and free IgE, and implying that it's, it's likely more potent. So there was a randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase 2b study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, where uh, in which subjects were randomized to um, uh, the arms of the study shown here. Uh, one arm got omalizumab at the FDA-approved dose of 300 milligrams every four weeks, and there were four arms in a dose-ranging study of legalizumab, and another arm was randomized to placebo injections every four weeks. And uh, these are the data from the study, urticaria activities, the proportion achieving an urticaria activity score of zero, which means they're high free at week 12. Uh, you can see here that the patients who um, were randomized to the two higher doses shown in the lower bars of legalizumab, uh, there was a higher proportion who achieved complete control of their urticaria. Um, not shown here is that the, there was a higher rate of benefit 
uh, early in the study at week four, implying that legalizumab has a faster onset of action. Not only that, but there was a longer time in relapse after these drugs were suspended and those randomized to the two higher doses of legalizumab, implying that the benefit is more durable, and there were no sa significant safety concerns observed in the study. Jason, back to you. Okay, so, you know, this is a kind of a meme that I, I like. If you look for problems, you'll find problems. If you look for solutions, you can always find a creative solution. And, you know, going back to first principles is uh, often uh, very helpful to kind of re-examine with a clean slate what you're doing. So we've got many conclusions here uh, from this engaging uh, discussion. Chronic urticaria, CSU, associated with a dysregulation of the immune system in the skin. I feel that, you know, it's probably a different manifestation of a similar dysregulation going in atopic dermatitis. That remains to be seen. The diagnosis, as Dr. Lang mentioned, is by exclusion and by careful questioning. So listening to patients and 90, 90 cents to a dollar for the uh, for where you put your resources in. Routine extensive diagnostic testing is not warranted. The primary care physician should refer to patients who don't respond to first-line therapy to an allergist or immunologist. Omalizumab is indicated in properly selected patients when antihistamine dose advancement or with or without H2 antihistamine and anti leukotriene therapy and or avoidance measures for physical or to care symptoms or syndromes as relevant is not sufficient to achieve control. Omalizumab is efficacious for many, but there remain many patients who are not controlled in spite of omalizumab. Agents that block cytokine signaling involved in the T2 inflammatory or inflammation pathway may provide an alternative to omalizumab. Dupilumab has shown promise in the recently res uh, resulted phase three clinical trial. Legalizumab has been shown promise in the phase 2B clinical trial. And we'll take some more question and answers here. So I'll read the next question for Dr. Lang. Um, you know, what is the second most type of type two comorbidity in atopic dermatitis? Um, I, maybe I should answer this. Yeah, why don't, you, why, don't yeah. You, why don't you go for that, Jason? Yeah, so the insurance uh, data that I presented and the very you know, meticulously organized study there shows that, uh, you know, in fact, number two is urticaria. Number one is nasal polyps. I was surprised by the nasal polyps, but, you know, it was uh, kind of a conceptually challenging and it challenged my preconceived notions that AD and urticaria may share some common pathophysiology. Yeah, it's, 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 um, I was going to say it's 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 intriguing that so many conditions in different organ systems, including the skin as well as the gut, with eosinophilic esophagitis, the upper airway, chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, and clearly the lower airway with asthma, that these are all linked in terms of uh, type two inflammation and epithelial barrier disruption. There's an interesting question here: What would be the escalation of doses with cetirizine and or hydroxyzine, and how long? continuing at the efficient doses, do you expect a possible recovery? And how do you stop the medicines without having a rebound? So, um, you know, uh, maybe you can tackle this, have some thoughts as well here. For sure. Me. So, uh, well, levocetirazine was, was uh, the agent um, in the, and the, the trade name for that is Zyzal, as you may know. So that's half the dose of that's five milligrams a day. Cetirazine is 10 milligrams a day. So when we dose advanced cetirazine, four times the FDA approved dose is 40 milligrams. Uh, this, is, this is off label for FDA administration, but there is high quality evidence supporting the therapeutic utility of this. Uh, as, uh, as we've said, Jason highlighted as well, um, some patients respond. Um, uh, when patients do not respond, then they graduate to the category of antihistamine resistant uh, chronic urticaria, and there are candidates for administration of an alternative agents, such as some of the agents we've discussed. Yeah, I think that, uh, um, you know, answers the question. So you look for the approved indication as a general rule of thumb, and you can go up to four times. Uh, uh, but for the interest of time. Um, Okay, so 
Thank you for participating today. And thank you, uh, Kenneth and Dr. Lang, and thanks to our audience for the great questions. I'd really like to uh, thank Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals for the support in this educational activity and, and really for, uh, you know, uh, hearing the ideas of, uh, of uh, you know, that some of us had on this area. Please remember to complete the uh, post test at the end of the session to secure your CME credits. And please visit immunologylive.com to view today's session along with other sessions on demand. Um, I'm Jason Lee, and thank you for joining us.